Hello, everyone, and welcome to NCTE On Air. I'm happy tonight to be joined by two esteemed guests who are going to help us think about how to enjoy our summertime by the pool, but also make the most of this breathing time we get before the new year, school year starts, uh, starts up again, to think about um, our approaches to instruction and our approaches to assessment. Since February, NCTE has been collecting stories from educators across the country who teach all disciplines, K through college, and, and we're asking them to tell us what they think about assessment. And tonight, we're going to share some of what we're learning from that project and what the implications of these learnings might be for your own summer learning plans. And we'll invite you to share your thoughts as well. So I'm going to start with a couple of quick housekeeping things um, that will tell you how you might do that. Uh, one thing is that in the upper right hand corner of your screen you'll see two icons, one that looks like a bunch of tickets for showcase and one that says Q&A. And if you click on Q&A, that's where you can enter questions um, that I'll share with our guests and that will be part of our discussion. The little thing that looks like tickets um, includes, it's called showcase, and that includes a variety of links to things that we'll be discussing during the, the, the talk tonight. We'll also be creating a blog after this is over, and that blog post will have um, the archive of this video, as well as any of the resources that you listen to our guests talking about tonight. So you don't have to worry if you're not able to write everything down. We'll make sure that that's available for you. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our guests tonight. Uh, I'll have them each share their name and where they work and what brings them here to discuss this topic. And we'll start with Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine Mitchell Pierce. I'm a sixth grade literacy teacher in the St. Louis area. Prior to that, I taught at the elementary level also in the St. Louis area. And I have been enjoying being part of this assessment story project for now about a year and have really learned a lot from listening to what teachers have to say about the class. All right, Rosie. Hi, I'm, I'm Rosie Rosario Ordonez Hasis, and I am a professor in the uh, Department of Literacy and Reading at Cal State Fullerton. Um, prior to this appointment, um, I was a first grade teacher, a preschool teacher, a reading coach um, in the California um, uh, districts. And I am very excited about being here tonight. This is my first time being on air. Um, and I look forward to talking a little bit about assessment and the role of bringing in the voices of families, um, parents, and their children um, into the overall assessment. Um, uh, assessments that we're doing with kids and thinking about what we can do over the summer uh, to prepare for a very successful fall. Great, thank you. So we're going to jump right in. There's a blog post up um, right now on the NCTE blog that gives an overview of some of the kinds of stories that we've been gathering. And we've collected some interesting examples of how folks are using assessment. The stories that we've gotten have spanned the gamut and you can hear everything about experiences with standardized testing, but then you can hear some things that um, are more complicated and very different um, than what many of us might be using in our classrooms. So I'm going to start by sharing just a couple of things um, that, that we've got up on that blog post. This one's from Karen, who's an elementary school teacher. She says, one example of, in, of informal formative assessment that I do in my fifth grade class occurs during interactive read-alouds. I consciously note who asks questions, who makes inferences, who, whose inferences are grounded in evidence from the text, who is able to access prior knowledge to deepen understanding, who is able to build an understanding of the main idea, informational text or theme, and who has difficulty with any of these aspects of comprehension. We've got a lot of um, examples in there that have to do with teachers taking notes based on these observations. Here's another one from Angie, who's a middle school teacher. She says, the most, uh, most useful assessment tool is my engagement with students and their families on a daily basis. I am constantly receptive to their verbal and nonverbal signals before, during, and after instruction, as well as communications to and from their families and guardians. In this way, I constantly modify my approaches, lessons, and assessments year to year, section to section, and student to student. And the last one I'll share is from Mary Beth, who is also a middle school teacher. Um, and there's many more that are listed on the website uh, or on that blog post. Mary Beth says, every day I collect some kind of student artifact or record, anecdotal evidence that demonstrates student mastery of the lesson's objective, usually a quick write, learning log, or exit ticket. I then go through the artifacts or records and make three stacks, and sometimes four, based on a simple rubric that students see at the start of the lesson. Got it and need more depth or complexity, need minor clarification and or more practice. 
and need reteaching and or a major clarification. And then she describes how she takes those um, stacks and those inform what she does in terms of her instruction the next day. So that's an example of the wide variety of kinds of stories that we get. And I wanted to start with some of those concrete examples um, and ask our guests, guests to talk a little bit about what do you think when you hear those examples, what implications might those have in your minds for how educators, if they hear something and they say, that sounds really interesting, what kinds of things would you imagine that they might do over the summer um, to think about trying some of those sorts of things? Well, one thing that comes to mind when I read what Mary Beth and um, Karen and Angie have written about uh, was the idea of using informal formative assessments to differentiate their instruction. Um, the idea of modification keeps coming out. And I work a lot with uh, students from diverse backgrounds, like we many teachers from across the country do in both urban and, and um, uh, urban and rural environments. And the need for us to really know our students. Um, Ann Dyson talks about the importance of being students of our students, um, although that we're the teachers and uh, we, we can't forget that we have a lot to learn from students and their families. And I love the idea of really thinking outside the box and uh, using an array of assessments to have a balanced approach to literacy instruction um, to really know our students as best we can given the, the number of students in our classrooms now. Um, it's really hard to really um, watch each one, um, but these are really good ideas of using anecdotal records, of really taking time to observe, to listen um, to the voices of students and their families, and I think it's a great start. And um, I think that starts us off on a really good um, note to have this conversation today. And I piggyback on that, I, I appreciate what Rosario shared in terms of this highlighting the fact that teachers are spending time really getting to know their students, uh, spending time observing them in action and collecting records, observational notes, and artifacts of the work that they see their students doing. I think it reminds me or highlights for me the importance of teacher professional observation and interpretation of what they're seeing. And I think um, there are some who would want to devalue the teacher's important knowledge that when a teacher watches what goes on in a classroom or watches two students interacting, teachers can see so much information in that experience that they have in their head. And so sometimes it doesn't feel professional or official or objective. Um, and yet those informal observations, in an, particularly for an experienced teacher, can be just so crucial in the way they interpret what their students need and how to respond in terms of learning experiences that they might offer later. <laughs> Listening to both of you talk, uh, it, I can get a, a good picture of the kinds of things that teachers might be doing when they're with their students in their classroom. But what does this make you think about the kinds of things teachers could do, particularly when we talk about observation and getting to know our students. Some of us don't even really know who our students are going to be over the summer. So how might we hone those kinds of skills or build up that kind of a toolkit um, when we're not around our students? Well, I'm really anxious to hear Rosario talk more about the community mapping work because I think that's one thing that teachers can do during the summer. And in fact, it's probably an ideal time to do that because you see kids and families interacting in ways that you don't have a chance to see while we're all in classrooms during the day during the regular school year. Um, in addition to that, I think, um, I think it was Karen mentioned in her sample the idea of collecting um, three piles of work. No, it was Mary Beth. Collecting three piles of work and just sort of saying, these kids get it, these kids are almost there, and these kids need some major reteaching of a concept. And I think as a teacher over the summer, I can do that. I can go back and look at some of the samples that I still have from last year's students and spend some time looking at those and ask myself what's working, what's not working, and that can help guide me into thinking about what I want to do differently next year. It's also a great time to pull in a colleague from another school or another grade level just to give some fresh eyes on my student sample and say, here's what I see in the work that you've collected from the students or your observations of them and to help me see them through the lens of another educator, which helps me in those conversations and tease out what are some of the things I really value here. And then I can be more um, focused with the students next year because I can be more clear about what it is we're after when we're engaging in these different experiences 
obviously leaving the room open for students to have input on that as well. But if I'm more clear about what I'm trying to help students learn to do or understand, then I can do a better job of communicating that with students as well. Great. That makes sense. Yeah. Rosario, how about for you? Well, you know, to um, Catherine, thank you for mentioning community mapping. And that's some, a project that I started um, in my graduate class. Um, I had students who are getting their reading specialist uh, credentials and added authorizations. And that oftentimes uh, the question had come up, how do I get to know my students? What are some things I can do over the summer? Uh, what are some things that I can do um, in preparation for the new academic year? And so what started out as kind of a, a neighborhood walk, um, getting to know your community by just meeting different you know, community informants and people in the, you know, parents and other uh, leaders in the community uh, kind of turned into a formalized way of looking at the resources and the needs of communities um, that surround our school sites. And so one of the things that I put together and written about over the last few years um, is the idea of community mapping, which is not new. Community mapping has been done in various fields from uh, sociology to um, uh, health to community health and urban planning. Um, but what I've done is to think about how can we locate the resources, specifically the language and literacy resources in communities, um, as a way for teachers to become insiders, right? We talk about insider, outsider community. And one of the frank conversations we have is that many of us don't live in the communities with which we teach. Uh, we tend to kind of go from our home to the school site and then afterwards we, we come home um, back, you know, um, oftentimes taking freeways or, or highways and not even really getting to know the communities. And so much like um, some of the teachers have written about in those, um, those blogs, um, the need for us to have protocols, right, whether they're anecdotal records or journals or field notes or our ways of chronicling our observations, essentially what it is is a toolkit uh, where we observe, uh, we listen, uh, we scout, we take notes, we write field notes, and reflect upon some of the resources um, that we find. And so what I ask teachers to do is to think about, you know, going into a community, um, although they may have worked there, even some have even lived there for many years, to go into the community with a new lens and to try to seek out resources um, and to kind of question assumptions that we have. And so we have them go out. There's a set of protocols, and we have, um, I shared a link earlier uh, with a, um, an article that was written about it that kind of goes a little bit more into detail about some of the teachers I've done this with in, in a local school community. But essentially, it's where you go out there and you have your field notes, and you go out there and you start looking to find out, okay, what are some of the cultural icons? What are some of the linguistic assets? What are some of the resources? And then how can I utilize this in my classroom? What does this tell me more about my students? How does this add to my overall assessment of, um, in terms of how I see students and the resources that they bring with them? A lot from the idea of community inquiry um, that's been written about and the idea of funds of knowledge that students have a lot of resources, communities have a lot of resources um, that they bring with them, this background knowledge, the schema that we need to tap into. And so our students, um, my candidates and teachers that I work with, go into the community um, and they, they do, they interview right, um, public officials, they interview, they go into City Hall to find out what are some of the local resources, after school programs, ESL programs. Uh, they go into churches and find out what kind of, you know, uh, resources they have from um, uh, soup kitchens to uh, closets for women who need um, access to interview type clothing um, to other kinds of resources that can help children with other, you know, their literacy development. And so they, what they do is they take note and they realize that there's a lot of resources they didn't know about. There's a lot of needs that they hadn't considered. And so they realize that the demographics of the school is maybe changing over the years that they didn't had not get recognized. So it's a nice way for us to kind of get to know the community and to really understand our students and their families at a much deeper level. Um, and so that's something that can easily be done over the summer, something that we can do just to, on a very, um, you know, on a very uh, on your own time, kind of downtime without any stress. Um, home visits is a great way of adding to your rapport of knowledge about community assets um, and, and even talking with parents and bringing them in on this. Um, I'd like to also piggyback on what Catherine had talked about is doing it with another colleague. Um, oftentimes my teachers who do this out in the, in the field do it with another as part of a community of practice and that's always really helpful for us to think about so you're not working in isolation but really working with others and it's much it's much more fun to ride a bus or to take the public transportation and really kind of get a feel for the community uh, with somebody else and you can share your ideas and you can sh share reflections and then you can analyze what does this mean in terms of you know um, 
practice for the next year? What does this mean for my curriculum and instruction? It reminds me of a colleague of mine who taught kindergarten when I was teaching elementary. She's now retired. But every day she stayed after school for a while and did things in her classroom. And then she put her tennis shoes on and she would walk for an hour. And she always walked the neighborhood near our school. And it's almost like community policing. I mean, if she was out in the community, parents and children would see her and she'd stop and introduce herself, especially if there were preschoolers. On this, you know, playing in the yard or something with their families, or out on a sidewalk, bicycles and bikes, and she just got to be so well known in the community because she was out almost every single day walking. And I think those resources not only gave her a sense of the neighborhood and the community that our students came in from, but it also gave her, I don't know, FaceTime validity with the families. They knew her; she was a familiar face. When I think about the challenges of kindergarten. How comforting to a family to bring their kindergartner to school and say, well, I recognize you. I see you in our community. I think that just offers a sense that this is someone who cares about my child, not just as a learner, but as, as a member of this community, and that she's dedicated and connected to the community. I think that makes a big difference. Exactly. You know, I, I hear that a lot from, from my teachers, the idea of going from an outsider to an insider, right? the insider-outsider perspective. And there was one um, case where there was a park, and everyone was afraid of this park. It was kind of like this boogeyman park where you, no one goes after school. It's supposedly the, the worst side of town, and, and you know you don't want to go there because there was violence there, there were gangs there, there were drugs. And so she you know, thought, you know what, I'm going to go there. I've been working in this district for about 15 years, and I've never gone to this particular park because supposedly it's very, very dangerous. Well, she went there as part of her committee mapping, and she went there after it was dark, um, and she went and she saw that there were some elderly doing some Tai Chi, there was some people doing Zumba dancing, there was an after school program, there was some drum storytelling going on, um, and so there was soccer going and baseball, and it was very much a family park. And yes, there was that element certain times of the weekend, but for the most part, the community had taken it back. And so she had, she had never would have known that. And so the smile on their faces uh, when her children saw her um, come in. And there was that connection she had with her community was just that much more enriched. Um, but she also, the, the drum storytelling was really important because she was able to incorporate that. She found out that they offer that um, every Tuesday afternoon. She was able to refer her kids to that. She was able to bring in one of the drum storytellers into her classroom, her first grade classroom, and utilize that as a way of um, bridging that gap between home and these school kinds of literacies that kids were partaking in on a daily basis. Um, well, Dario, earlier you mentioned the idea that the teachers that you send out into the community have certain protocols that they use that help them sort of organize what they're looking for and organize the notes that they're taking. And I wonder if you can talk about that just a little bit because I'm beginning to make connections myself to the idea of protocols that teachers use during the school year and how spending time over the summer creating and reflecting on and fine-tuning those protocols or getting familiar with new ones uh, during the downtime of summer can really set you up well for the fall. So can you just talk a little bit about what you've seen as the advantages of working with protocols? Well, one of the things I, because when, when I first started teaching, a first grade teacher many years ago, I remember doing those uh, neighborhood walks with my principal. He'd take out the whole as part of staff development beginning of the year. We'd have these community walks, which were wonderful. Um, but there wasn't any kind of debriefing or analysis or any kind of connection to practice. It was just a way of getting to know the community. And, and so what we've developed um, over time, um, my, my co-researchers and I, were these set of protocols to be able to, be able to do something with the information. Um, it's important to just know the community, but I think that when we connect it to practice, um, it becomes that much more powerful. And so what we've done was to take on Think about teachers as ethnographers, right? And if we are teachers as researchers, we go out there, and it's not much different than what we already do. We already collect data, right? We collect scores, we analyze, and we disseminate the information. So as teachers, we really are researchers. And so I just want to formalize that process a little bit. And so what I've done was create a set of protocols for teachers so that they know how to take the notes, how to what to look for, and then reflect upon that, and then think about how does that connect to practice. So it's really three three-tier process where we collect the data through anecdotal records or our observations, uh, writing down direct quotes whenever possible when we're interviewing people. And I call them interviewing, but really other conversations, rich conversations with community informants, with its parents, 
um, its church officials, whoever it is that we think can add to our body of knowledge about what we know about the schools that we work in. And then we reflect upon that. You know, we come home, we think about that a little bit, and reflect about what does this mean, right? So I have a, you know, a what did I find, then so what, right? And then now what? So this, the what would be the things that we find, and then we think about, okay, well now what? What does this mean? Um, what does this mean for the family literacy programs I'm putting together? What does this mean for my language arts? What does this mean for my assessment protocols that I've developed? The writing rub rubrics, right? Um, and then now what, right? The what, the so what, and then now what do I do with this? How can I connect that to the practice? And so I've developed a set of protocols, um, but it's important for us to organize this body of information, much like we do our assessments, right? We gather that, we analyze it, and we think about, okay, who do we need to disseminate this to, right? And who, who, do, who needs to be in the conversation? So community mapping is not that much different, that we think about, okay, what are we collecting? Who do I need to bring in this conversation to make the kind of changes that I want to see in my classroom and maybe school-wide? And I've been more familiar with using protocols to process samples of student work. And mm -hmm. Jenna, I don't know if we can put the link up to the work with critical friends groups. But that was probably the group that helped me think um, in, more, in greater detail about the different protocols that we can use for looking at student work or looking at our own work. And I think um, particularly there's protocols for looking at student work so that when a group of professionals gets together around the table or family members and professionals together, looking at samples of student work and then asking ourselves, what is it that we're going to do in this conversation? And what I love about Critical Friends, you know, that roles page is great. Thank you. Um, on that roles page, it um, having a protocol and knowing what role each participant is going to play helps to make sure that that conversation is very efficient while also being generative. And so like if I'm the presenting teacher and I'm bringing samples of my student work, the protocol allows us to dig quickly into some of the questions that I'm asking about the student work and give me the classroom teacher easy uh, thoughtful access to other people's perspectives on what I'm looking at. And like you said, Rosario, helping other people give you new eyes on what you're seeing can help you see beyond your own assumptions and biases. Um, mm -hmm. just to slide down a little bit further, uh, there's some sample protocols in that chapter there. When you slide down, there are several that, uh, there we go, you can choose protocols then for talking about text, if teachers are discussing professional texts, or if you even keep going, there are protocols for looking at samples of student work, and protocols for putting your own work out for others to respond to it. And I just find the use of protocols so valuable. And initially, sometimes it feels like we spend time teaching the protocol, mm -hmm. and like, no, I just want to get into the work. But once you know the protocol, you can just say, oh, we're going to do a tuning protocol, and everybody knows exactly what their roles are and then how to move ahead. And you can spend more time on the work and less time figuring out how to do the work. Yeah. yeah. No, that, um, that makes a lot of sense. And listening to, um, listening to all of you think it's listening to all of you talk about, um, listening to Rosario talk about her work with community mapping and then the way that you're drawing those connections, Catherine, I see the connections so so well, not only in terms of what kinds of skills of um, observation and how we think about what we're learning and how it applies to what we're doing, but also the practice of having these protocols or these procedures for how we, are, we analyze work particularly together. It seems like the idea of finding ways to connect with your peers over the summer around these things um, would be really valuable too. And I just wanted to share um, one more resource here. Um, I'm going to make sure I pull it up. Uh, when Rosario was talking about um, the work that she's done around community mapping, she was part of a project with, uh, let's see here, I'm pulling it up. She was part of a project with the National Center, uh, or the Center for, um, National Center for Literacy Education. Um, and NCLE uh, has a website called the Literacy and Learning Exchange, and what you're seeing up there on the screen right now is a page that you can find. Um, it's uh, Literacy and Learning Exchange and then um, forward slash community dash mapping. And again, all these links will be available to you after this um, broadcast. But 
if you go to this page, uh, there's records of this webinar that they did, and you can read uh, one of the articles that Rosario was mentioning, Valuing Families, Funds of Knowledge. Um, and that's something that comes from, I believe that's the one, uh, oh, okay, that, that's, that's a different one than what I'm thinking of, but we also have an article uh, that came from one of our journals um, that describes a community mapping project um, that was done in one particular, with a, with a professional learning community in one particular school district. Am I right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you for sharing this. Um, so this has to uh, do with a project um, I had mentioned that I mostly work with my graduate students, um, but this particular project was a five-year project with uh, Roland Unified School District um, here in Southern California in the Los Angeles area. And so what that did, it chronicled um, some of our work, and it has a couple of videos from teachers um, to talk, that talks firsthand about what the experience was like for them uh, to go out into the community and to really chronicle uh, some of the language and literacy resources. Um, and what that meant for their language arts instruction, what that meant for their assessment, um, and what did that mean for their um, their uh, means of engaging families in a more meaningful um, and critical way. Um, there is an article from Language Arts um, that I also, there's a link I sent you to, um, it's a free uh, downloadable article uh, from Language Arts, um, and that also chronicles um, the work of one particular um, teacher, a middle grade teacher, um, and how he was able to incorporate some of the, um, those funds of knowledge into his classroom. Um, really great guy, his name is George, and um, he, I believe he was one of the co-authors on that particular article. And, um, and he really kind of turned upside down uh, his assumptions about uh, student ability um, and really what uh, some of our, what we call reluctant readers and writers were able to do once we're able to kind of connect some of our lessons, some of our writing instruction to things that they know about, things that they can write about, things that they're excited about. Um, and so, uh, you know, for example, there was one boy, um, his name was Eric, and he asked that we use his real name, and so we did. Um, and a wonderful little boy who uh, was kind of, in Spanish, we call it a travieso, uh, which is um, not quite lazy, just a little, um, what's the word, not, a little naughty. I guess. <laughs> and so he was a sixth grader who came in and kind of slouched and, you know, wasn't disrespectful, but just wasn't fully engaged. And so he, um, after looking at the community, he was looking at some of the rich, rich resources um, um, in terms of uh, Spanish language usage and some of the um, community art and other kind of icons. Um, and so he brought them into the classroom. And one of the things that he found was there was a lot of poetry and music in the community. And so he had to do, as part of his fifth grade, sixth grade poetry unit, um, he asked them all to bring in something from their home because he did a lot of, part of his mapping was doing home visits um, and parent interviews. And so he knew there was a lot of poetry they can choose from. And so he, everyone brought something back except Eric. And um, he followed up the next day and said, Eric, you need to bring something from home or else I don't want to call your mom. He was, the mom was a single mom. And so he went home and said, Mom, he said, I have to bring something from home, and I don't know, you know, really what to bring. We don't have poetry. And the mom says, let me, I have something for you. And so she went into her closet and opened up a chest, and she pulled out a poem that she had written for him while she was pregnant with him that he <laughs> had never shared with him before. And so he was just thrilled to bring in. He walked in. He said almost skipping um, and was very happy and joyful to share this piece of art, you know, this poetry that uh, and artwork uh, from his mom and to see that his mom was a poet and that poetry is not so outside of ourselves. Poetry isn't something that's not accessible. And so he was able to write a, a written reflection um, on that poem. And though they're analyzing poems, why not analyze the poems that are found within families' homes and things that they cherish? Um, and so it's just his level of engagement and his enthusiasm and motivation you can imagine we're off the charts. Um, so that was just kind of one example of that um, this article and that website um, that was just pulled up talks about um, first-hand accounts of what this means um, and then assessing student ability, right? Mm -hmm. And had he not had the opportunity to shine, our assessment of him would have been very maybe one-sided. Yeah, exactly. I'd like to tag on to something that you had from the NCLE Learning Exchange also. Um, Charlene Klassen and Dreese's name was up there for her book, Teaming. And I had a chance to work with that project for two years and in Pennsylvania. And I think Charlene has done a really masterful job of inviting family members into the school to be an active, integral part of the assessment conversations about their readers. And so I'd just like to throw out for people 
um, some possibilities that they could do over the summer to help set something like that up. Um, one of the things that Charlene did is had families come in in the evening, provided food for everybody, and a place for kids to hang out so that adults could also have conversations. It was hard to leave your kids at home during the dinner hour. Um, so she planned for that at school and then asked the family members to contribute to conversations about what is it that you value in your child as a reader, what information have you seen at home that helps you get to know your child as a reader that you can then also share with us to help us get to know your child as a reader. And also asking family members what evidence you look for to confirm for yourself that your child is growing and getting better as a reader. And those same questions came out of a project that we had done here in St. Louis, asking family members of third and fourth readers, what evidence do you want from us that your children are growing as readers? And it's interesting, they didn't say test scores and higher grades. They said they wanted evidence of things like kids throwing books in a soupy when they go on vacation, or kids being able to contribute at the dinner table something they've been reading, or a question or a comment about an author or a theme in a book or an, um, an experience in a book that they wanted to process with their family in some way, similar to the way some people uh, process with having a soap opera or something like that. Um, but those are the kinds of data that the family members wanted as having to the kids were growing as readers. They were choosing to spend time that they felt comfortable with it. And so I think one thing that we can offer during the summer is a chance for family members to come together with school leaders to talk about how are we going to know if our school is doing well. Because I think the test scores are out there a minimalist way of looking at how the school is doing. And so I'm thinking myself, just having finished a year with sixth graders, inviting some of those sixth grade families and students back in the summer to say, hey, let's talk about what you noticed in your child and what kinds of things could we send home for you, tell you more about how your child is doing and what kinds of things could you share with us and what kinds of things should we ask new parents about to help us get to know their children as readers. So that it's clearly a two-way street when families and school officials are talking about learning, not for the school teaching families how to be reading teachers, but rather tell us from your perspective and your rich expertise about your child and then help us understand. And I think that back and forth is really an important part of assessment. And I think it helps also when build community support for richer assessments than what's available in most of our standardized assessments. Um, so I think spending time in the summer figuring out a plan for how to have those conversations to be valuable. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, one of the things, um, even just listening to the two of you, you are veteran educators. You've been uh, in and around and supporting schools for some time. Um, and one of the things that strikes me in listening to just the way that you're talking about this work and the ideas that you're able to kind of throw out and also something that I noticed from reading um, the stories that are shared with us through, through the Assessment Story Project is this notion that if you're an experienced educator, um, some, your, your toolkit is that much bigger based on your experience. You have confidence to try new things. Um, your, your skills of observation and your ability to apply inquiry and use questions spontaneously, these are all things that you've built over time. And so what I'm really thinking about um, is new teachers. So I'm a brand new teacher to the classroom and some people in some of the stories have kind of expressed this notion that it's sort of overwhelming. You know you need to be able to read your students well, you know you need to know the families really well, you know you need to know these different assessment practices but it's just so overwhelming and you feel like you're building the plane and flying it at the same time. Um, so I was wondering if each of you could share um, some ways that new teachers might be able to use this summer to gain some experience and knowledge and some of the examples that you've given just in terms of walking in the community and meeting people are huge steps in that direction, but are there other ideas that you would give particularly for new teachers? If you want to put up that plus minus delta form that we adapted from Carol Gillis at the University of Missouri, Columbia, I think that's a really concrete protocol. Again, we bring back to Rosario's use of protocols for the community visits. 
um, having a protocol for looking at student work can help you get more sophisticated lenses for looking at that student work. And so Carol Gillis introduced this to our school district when she came in to work with us as a consultant. And then we've played with it a lot since then. But over on the left, um, the plus is what are the things that are going really well? Like, you can either look at my whole class this last year, like what went well in first grade for the first year that I taught first grade, or it could be when I look at the samples of student work, what's going really well here? Like, what am I excited about? What do I want to run around and share with other people? And then on the other side, the minus, and we all look at those things like the shortcomings. What are the things where kids are just not living up to what we had hoped or are giving indication that we haven't done enough to support them in their growth? So the minuses go in that column. And then down on the bottom, the one that I think we frequently forget, at least I do, is I'm so quick to jump to the minuses that I need to stop and take time to do the pluses to celebrate the small steps of growth that kids are actually making. But then to look at the things where the kids are not doing as well as I had hoped, or not yet, and say, but what's the one place where I feel like we might have some leverage or we think of the Gatsby's notion of the zone of proximal development, I think they're almost ready to do, that oftentimes that's a good choice for the next step of instruction. And if you're familiar with reading recovery, it's similar to take assessment data every single day to help you get a sense of what's a good next step for this individual or for this group. And so that form has been really helpful to me and also in talking with early career teachers to identify how do I start looking at this work and make a plan out of it instead of just being overwhelmed with everything I see that my kids aren't doing or that they are doing. Mm -hmm. That's really important. I work a lot with um, first year teachers who um, are going through the Bits Up program, beginning teacher um, programs that are in our state and also maybe going back to school to get their reading certificate and um, they're overwhelmed and so the summer you want to just rejuvenate, you want to you know kind of rest and relax and um, and it's the best time you know to be creative. I uh, you know I, I, I like the idea of focusing on just one area. Uh, focusing on one area with somebody else because we know that teachers who collaborate are most likely to make those kinds of changes in their classroom. Um, and, and to think about something maybe at the grade level, um, just the one area that you want to focus in on, something that I love the protocol that was just shared because, you know, what went well, what didn't go well. Um, and to give yourself kudos for things that did go well and think about, okay, what do I want to improve upon? Um, and then maybe just having one other colleague over, you know, uh, lunch once a week. Um, to think about, is it something in the classroom? Is it connecting to the community? Um, doing it, going and, and attacking it together. I think that's probably one of the best things that a new um, teacher who feels inexperienced um, to, to can do is to maybe work with another teacher who has a little bit more experience or, or someone who's just as new and um, you know, be vulnerable together to talk about things that go in the classroom. You know, we, the, one of the most isolating feelings to be sometimes a classroom teacher with so many people, but yet you're by yourself as an adult. Um, if you're fortunate to have an aide um, and one that you can truly collaborate with, that's that's the best. But oftentimes you go into our classroom, close the door, um, and we're pretty much on our own. And so the summer is a great time to break that isolation and to work with somebody else. Um, and to think about putting um, some protocols together using the one that was just up. Um, think about maybe getting to know the community, interviewing parents, and get a group of teachers, um, sorry, a group of parents together. Uh, maybe ones that you've had, or if you have your list for next year, um, inviting them in with some, um, you know, light refreshments and drinks, and asking them a little bit about their kids and their expectations for the year, and bring them on as allies. Um, you know, they'd be I'm, a lot of parents. What I find are really eager to help in the classroom, but oftentimes as inexperienced teachers, we don't know how to carve out that space, or we may be feeling a little insecure about having other adults into our class in our classroom, especially parents because we might we may be judged. But having a core group of parents on your side is going to make the year that much easier. It's going to have the transition for the kids that much easier. Um, and, I, and doing some interviewing. I, I like, we talked a little bit about, you know, asking parents certain key questions. But one of the protocols that I used came from Rebecca Rogers, and she wrote an article out of the research, um, research quarterly called Storied Selves, a Critical Discourse Analysis of Adult Learners' Literate Lives. And so there are questions that we can ask parents in really three categories. Uh, questions about their involvement in their child's education, 
questions about uh, relating to their own experiences in school, which can tell us a lot about um, how they are um, in terms of whether they're going to come to campus or not. Maybe they didn't have a good experience themselves, or maybe their parents were very involved, and so you have a sense of where they're coming from. And the third kind of question asks about their literacy uh, practices outside of school. And so those three areas can really give us a lot of information. Um, they're involved with their own education, their past experience with their schooling, um, whether it's in this country or another country, and how that differs. Oftentimes, I work a lot with immigrants. Um, and their school experiences are very different from that of the U.S. And so they may ha be highly educated, but of school systems that are very different, and they don't know how to navigate U.S. school systems. Um, so finding that information is really important. And then about their literacy practices, asking them about some of the um, things that they do at home. And, and, and what I find is that it's really important for us to really rethink, if we're going to rethink uh, ways that we can involve families, uh, we need to rethink maybe literacy as well. And so oftentimes we have surveys that go home that says pretty much do you read 20 minutes a day with your child? And if the answer is no, we make certain assumptions or assessments about that child's um, literacy experiences in the home. But if we talk about what are some of the other things that we do, for example, do you sing with your child? Do you have stories? Um, do you have any kind of sayings that you, you know, you or, or idioms um, that you use at home or any kinds of ways that you play games? Um, then we'll find out there's a lot of rich literacy practices. And so some of the things that an experienced teacher can do is really kind of get to know the family and via the parents or the car legal guardians, we can get to know the kids a little bit more. And then think about who, how, what are some ways that I can change my instruction just a little bit to really kind of connect uh, with some of these um, practices that are going on in the homes and communities. That's great. Uh, so many rich ideas here. Yeah, Catherine? I was just going to quickly tag on. Um, Rosario mentioned several things, uh, articles and things, and had posted things that are on the NCLE um, Learning Exchange. And I think summer is a great time to get caught up on your professional reading. Mm -hmm. And even though I feel like I have the whole summer ahead of me, I look at all the books I want to read and all the journal articles that I put on the side for the summer, and there's no way I can do them all in one summer. And my good friend, um, Ann O'Connor, who's a first grade teacher, and she's one of the most thoughtful teachers I've ever had the pleasure to teach side by side with. And she chooses one professional book that she reads over the summer, and she keeps a journal of everything that comes to her mind while she's reading it, notes to herself about what she might try in her classroom or what questions she has. She just lives with that book all summer. And then when the school year starts, she commits herself to making some changes in her classroom that year based on that book. Mm -hmm. Where I tend to do the scatter approach and read 100 things and try to make 100 changes, and she reads one, and she lives with it all year long. And by the end of that year, she knows that author well. She knows the ideas in that book well. And she really played them out against her own practice and her own experiences and makes it her own during the year. Um, but then she, she owns that book. And forevermore after that, any year, you can say, well, two years ago, you read such and such. And she can tell you a lot about that book. Mm -hmm. I think there's something manageable about saying, I'm going to read one, right. and I'm going to stick with it deeply. And then there will be time to do another one later. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I I can't. Uh, we've we've had so many ideas, and I can't believe how quickly the time has flown by. <laughs> but I'm really excited um, to to share all this with folks who've been able to tune in to us uh, live tonight, and then also this video will be available um, forever after when we're done here. In addition to um, a blog post where I'll list all of the resources that we've talked about, I was wondering in closing if each of you would think I'm going to go over a couple um, uh, housekeeping items, but think a little bit about a parting thought that you'd like to leave with our viewers. Um, we're living in an environment where talking about assessment and testing is incredibly stressful, and lots of teachers are, we've been talking about really um, interesting, rich, thoughtful approaches to getting to know communities and um, working in collaboration with our peers. And some people might be listening or watching and say, that sounds great, but I'm, that's not what my reality is. So I'm wondering if you could think about a piece of advice that you have for our listeners about how to use this, the recharging that's available during the summer to come in um, feeling strong about trying some of these new approaches. Um, and here's a quick uh, housekeeping things. We're going to have another NCTE on air coming up this month. Um, stay tuned for the time and date when we'll talk about these, this same topic, but we'll be looking at it um, from the context of high school and college. What can we do in, in that uh, grade span? Um, to think about assessment over the summer. 
And then another reminder, this survey we've been talking about, the Assessment Story Project, um, that story project closes out on June 15th. If you have not shared your story yet, please do. Your voice matters. These stories are going to inform um, research that we're doing uh, and we'll be sharing publicly with um, the whole community uh, in the next uh, several months. And they also help NCT to get a better lay of the land of what's happening um, with assessment out there from the people who are experiencing it firsthand. So we'll close out. Who, who would like to go first? Um, go ahead, Rosario. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, I do, um, um, I hear, I hear that quite often. Um, that's just not my reality, and I am I, I'm so under so much pressure. Um, to do these kinds of very um, narrow assessments on my students, but I remind, I remind my graduate students, I remind the teachers that I work with out in the field um, that assessment is supposed to guide our instruction, right? And we're supposed to have a very holistic view of children that sometimes it's forgotten in this very kind of narrow definition of assessments and the kind of pressure teachers are under. And I think that it's important for us to have this kind of um, conceptual congruency um, of how students perform and we can only really get that by engaging families, engaging parents, um, so they can let us know what's going on with the children outside of the classroom walls. Um, and so once we're able to connect with families um, in a very meaningful, um, mutually beneficial way, I think we'll have that other side of what students are able to do. Um, maybe they're not doing quite yet, but what they could do one day, what they should be doing. Um, so engaging families in that conversation, uh, engaging uh, students, allowing for them to be part of you know, their assessment, doing a lot of interviewing with them, doing, you know, in interest inventories, allowing them for to choose what they want it, that's going to be ultimately placed in their portfolio is really, really powerful. Um, so we want to engage students and their families as much as possible for us to really have um, a, a wider view of student ability. I agree 100% with that. And I think my idea is probably just tag on. Um, one really simple one is that you know, when you come across a sample of something that a student has done that you are just giddy about is be sure you run and share that with someone else, particularly someone who's in power to make decisions about the assessments in your building or your district. So making sure your administrator learns to see what you see in student samples. Share with parents. And frequently through our school newsletter, or, or sorry, our team newsletter, or when I was in a classroom by myself, classroom teacher newsletter, sharing with families look at the sample that I'm sharing here and see what I see in it and I'll share what you see in it. So that when they see the piece has all that invented spelling and they're so worried about that, that I can help show them another lens for looking at that same sample that helps them see what I'm celebrating. Um, and then the other one is to consider the possibility of creating these alternate assessment opportunities where or invite the community in for like a learning museum where kids get to choose what they want to showcase that they've been working on that they're passionate about and invite the community to come in to see evidence of their learning. Evidence that makes sense. It doesn't have to be interpreted by reading a stat chart, but evidence that's interpreted by saying, wow, look what my kid did in school this year and here's the evidence tangible right in front of you. I think that builds community support for richer assessments and it also opens up the conversation because the families get to see how we as a school are celebrating what their kids are doing and drawing attention to the positive things that are happening to them in our classroom. And just a final thought, um, mm -hmm. uh, to, to loop back to where we started uh, with those, those great messages from those three teachers, the idea of modifying, right, and differentiate our instruction um, and to really kind of understand where our students are as best we can um, is really, really important. So that loop back to the beginning I think is was a really great start to this conversation that I don't want to kind of return to that I need for us to really kind of look at each student as best we can individually um, and then guide our instruction to best um, suit their needs. Mm -hmm. Alright, well I'm, I'm fired up. Who needs summer? We're ready to go tomorrow. <laughs> thank you both of you. Thank you so much Catherine. Catherine, thank you Rosario and thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. Good night. Thank you Jenna. Thank you.